We're back with part two of the Melbourne Punters paddle, where uh, Potts and I are going to have a look back at the long 10 race card there at Caulfield on Saturday for Sir Rupert Clark Stakes Day, with the Golden Nugget uh, thrown in the end there, because we couldn't race with Ballarat, and from what I've seen, Potts, I don't think we'll be at Ballarat till Cup Day, so um, the track got pretty ripped up over the winter, so it was a bit, it was a big day there, and uh, we kicked off in the first with Chase of the Horizon. I just want to say, I could have done without that last race, Jumpy. It, it did turn it into a real long day. Like it was, it was quite funny. I had an odd day on. It left a very sour taste in the mouth too. I think that horse winning that, you know. Why that? Sh that, that horse has got a very peculiar form card, and uh, I would like to have someone explain it to me. But uh, well, I don't want to say any more than that. Well, I also wanted to explain why you put the lowest prize money race on as the last race of the day. Um, I know it was a big fear, but it was a joke. The first was taken out by a chase of the horizon. Potsy it was. 480 top plug, a little bit of a nibble, 460 SP, and it was 420 across the totes. It's funny, it's been built up a good win. Can I just say, before we go in, the track was really interesting. It's one of the features yeah. of the day there on Saturday, Jumpy. It's, um, the grass, when I walked uh, last week, was the longest grass I've seen on the track. You know, um, Apart from those bare patches that were between the 600 and the 300 that are probably going to be fully recovered by the time the next meeting that comes. Yeah. When I say bear patches, I just mean they were, there was patches that had really short grass on them. Yeah. All the, you know, along that side so, of the track. Yeah. Um, till the home turn, and uh, the, the, all around them, the grass was extremely long. So it was a really testing track, and I think, um, generally speaking, so I'm just generalising. Yeah. The horses that ran well there on Saturday will get a real fitness benefit out of racing on that track. I think. All of the that's just going to be a really good foundation for a lot of the horses that were there on Saturday. So well, well I'll give you an update, Potts, because I went out to Caulfield first thing in the morning on Sunday morning to pick up some gear on my way to Packingham, and they had the team of mowers running around yeah. on the course proper there mowing it then. So I assume yeah. it'll be cut back now, especially with the weather we've got this week with another drop of rain, and then hopefully some sun after that, and we'll, we'll kick right back because we have got the next four weeks then. Yeah, and the other really interesting thing that I noticed on Saturday, Juppy, was. Just to, you know, just to complicate the matters even further for us punters. So early on in the card, you really wanted to be drawn wide. Yep. And you wanted to race off the rail. Correct. Um, we got we got to about right the middle of the card. Yep. And the sun started shining quite strongly. Yep. Though, you know, nice day. The, this direction of the sun, and particularly on the side of the track, even a little bit down the back, the, the sun was shining and putting the shadow of the rail about three off the fence. Yeah. And watching the stewards footage, all the jockeys were following that shadow. That shadow. The horses yep. didn't want to go inside the shadow. So the inside, in those races like, uh, I think probably seven and eight, it might have been, maybe even nine, seven, eight, nine. No horse went within three horses Oops. from the rail. So earlier in the card, the neater you got to the rail, the tougher you were doing it. Yeah. And the horse that, so if, if, the, if the inside horses were neat to the rail, the ones that were three off were getting an advantage. You move all the whole field yeah, three, three wider, yeah. and it's reversed. Yeah. So Jamaica's actually getting the advantage. Advantage, yeah. She was in and the right part of the track. Set squares disadvantage, as just an example, and the other horses in that line. So, um, it was a. I mean, you know, I don't know. You, can, you can't plan for these things. No. Like you've got to. You know, with the sun shining or not when they jump. It's, you know what I mean? it's, like it's, it's just a moving target. That one isn't. Pays it to is. be on. It's one of the few benefits of being on course where you can get out there with your binoculars and have a bit of a look. And, uh, and then race 10, the sun obviously, I don't know if it went behind oh, the grandstand or, or set or whatever, but they'll back hard against the fence again. So it was very it was peculiar. A, well, it probably helps Jason Kerr too, with it because the rail was out and they've used like the real outer part of the track, haven't they? Yeah. For most of the day. So, so you anyway, know, let's just go through these races quickly. Chase the Horizon's gone well. It's just a meat and potatoes race. Um, the Kiwi Mare's run really well first up. She'll be better for that run. If she dropped track to Mare's grade, she'll be very hard to beat. Shillelagh, I think we're calling her. Yep. And um, St. Valorum's done a really good job. First go at 1,200. Uh, he's, a, he's a bit of a horse to follow as well. So, race two. Uh, race two was taken out by one week back to, uh, on the early set pots, which was Barcelona. He's a nice little, he's, a, he's only a pony. Yeah, he's not big, is he? He's a little horse, um, but he's got a really fast sectional. Like one, yep. He can really run 200 metre. So, like, he was in a bit of trouble there on Saturday. Yeah. As soon as he got into the open where he, like he picked them up really quickly. So the race is a bit of a nothing. Uh, the giveaways are the Godolphin horse getting checked and the non-protest there and 
so forth. But uh, so it's not much of a race. So they're not really horses I'm getting excited about, except for the fact that they are three-year-olds. And if they were to race older horses, I'd look at them. Yep. But anyway, uh, race three was won by Exocet, who was 12 in a 750. And I'm going to channel my inner Bruce McAvaney here, boss. He got a Dwayne Dunn smash. <laughs> because don't lead on anything, Dwayne, but you, geez, you can ride them flash when you need to. Yeah, well, I mean, the horses up the front of the field there were pretty suspect. They've all just collapsed, and Exocet sort of just picked them up. Where the other main chances that were back markers never got a clear run. The Adelaide horse and yeah. Serenely Discreet, I think it was called. So. It's a nothing win. It's but she's a nice horse. She she was that price in the early markets because on raw times the Geelong win wasn't that good, but she actually was really stylish. Yeah. And she's got she was only having a second run, third up there on Saturday, so she's a nice filly, but you know, they've got a way to go yet, those mares. Um, race four was taken out by Alaskan Rose, who was Mares race, bunch finish, who uh, cares? Twelve out of fourteen and yeah, it was a bit of a dot ball of a race really, wasn't it? Yeah. Because it was just Alaskan Rose has done well, but who cares? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um he, uh, race five was taken out by a horse that I failed to cop the tip on, which was Harlow Gold, which was a four sixty chance. Yeah. Beating Rocketeer and Kachin. Well, here's a horse you can talk about. Yeah. So I posed her on Saturday. Yeah. Foolishly, I, I knew she was a filly with real talent, but I just have a real issue with horses coming off the synthetic, going on the testing tracks. So I just, generally speaking, don't think they've got the fitness base they need, and to be able to they've fallen over one after another after yeah. another. So it's a, it's something I'm prepared to cop every now and again getting wrong. Yeah. And the answer to um, finding the ones that can overcome it are ones that have got a real talent advantage. She's got a massive talent advantage on. All, she's the only filly in the race. This is the best three-rod race of the day, and I mean she's just gone enormous, and she she comes out of it with so much more, with a full hand of positives. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like she didn't have a lot in the favour there on Saturday, except for her talent. Yeah. And she won anyway, and she like you know I'm sure everyone's seen the run on. She was so far in front, it wasn't even funny. Yeah. And. I know they probably just want to win all the three-year-old village races with her, but I mean, I'd stick her in a Cox Plate. She, she's. Who are you going to get to ride her pots? Can yeah. Reggie get down to forty-six? Yeah. What's What's the? Is she a three-year-old filly? Yeah, she's three. I think they get they the forty-six or, or yeah. no? Because don't the Colts get? There's an interesting Whatever question. But yeah. yeah, like if you want to aim really high, mm. like I'm not saying she'd beat Winks, but she'd um, you know. If, if there's ever a year then. for a three-year-old to have a yeah. crack at a Cox Plate, this is it. You know well, the thing I mean? is, so outside of Winks, it doesn't look like it's going to be the deepest Cox Plate of all time. It's... Just have a look what the three-year-olds are doing every time they take on the older horses out wider. You well, know they're what just I mean? crushing they just, them. They just win everything. Yeah. And they're, not, it's, they're well, winning it's, them easily, like, yeah, very it's, easily. It's not even a fair fight. Yeah. Um, race six uh, was taken out by Secret Agenda, who was uh, 320 into 280. Yeah, another man's right. I mean, she was coming from good form with that, you know... I think it might have been around Fartner and all that Adelaide yeah. stuff, you know. Um, there she was. I don't think she's gone particularly well, but she killed these other crappy mares, so she can do better than that. So she's the only horse I'm interested in out of that race. Uh, race seven was the Testarossa Stakes, uh, taken out by the really consistent um, Tina Ray, who was four dollars across the totes, three eighty top flight. And we were also on well sprung early pots, and I, I wish that uh, well another one for Alfred, who's the place putter, and he's filled up again. We've got a horse to follow for Alfred too. Oh, have Happy. we? Yeah, yeah. How about Alfred of Clomel? Oh, you, we'll get we'll get to him. <laughs> what, I'll tell you what, you don't see too many of them do that on the synthetic. Go and have a go and watch that replay, punters. That horse tried very hard to get rid of the jockey in the first 150 200 metres. He pig rooted in, twice in coming out of the gates at Packingham on Sunday. In doing so, yep. he lost probably four to five lengths, and he uh, won. Anyway, um, what are we talking about? Oh, Kuna Ray. Um, Is he Alfred or Albert? Oh, he might be Albert. It's one for you, Al Alfie, Al anyway. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we're we're already naming Alfred. <laughs> yeah. Right, well, he's, from now on, he'll be known uh, as Alfred of Clonmel. Sorry. Oh, can I just bring up one other point while we're talking about renaming of horses? A little bit off the charts here. I enjoy reading The Barefoot Investor. It's got... Scott Pape, who writes for the Harold Sun and a few other things. Simone has bought a horse, and they named it the Barefoot Investor. It won a Cranbourne. Um, Is Simone something to do with Scott? He sent them 
a strongly worded email suggesting that he owns the copyright and the name oh, Barefoot Investor yeah, and that it would yeah. be in their best legal interest to change the name of the horse. Come on, Scott, that's un Australian. Yeah, mate, come on, that's a bit uh, precious there, Scott. Anyway, um, geez, I thought Will Sprung had won on the line, Jumpy. Did you? I was, in the, I was in the car. I didn't see it, I was just listening. Looks like it won. I even when I watched the replay, I think it's won. What a pity it didn't win. Um, <laughs> we backed Keen Array, but we also backed. It would have been large on uh... Well Sprung at the big odds, and um, anyway, he's run well. The race is just a fair race. Secret Agenda's probably gone better than them, so not much to say about it. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's just it's good meat potato Saturday form. Uh, race 8, and I'm not going to call it the Bendigo Bank East Melbourne MRC Foundation Cup, it's the Naturalism Stakes. There we go. Uh, like I'm not going to call it the Optic White Stakes in um, Sydney, it's the George May. Yeah. Uh, Jamaica, great ride, showed the f there was probably not too much wrong with the fence where Nicole cut the corner. Bookies were a bit keen to take her on, she was 5 out of 6.50, uh, but it might also be because they did back a few others in the race. Yeah, it was, just, it was a good betting race, it was a good race, it's, uh, they've run really strong time. It, that's a good platform for these horses. She's going to be race well and everything she goes in, set squares in for a good campaign, she's going well. Uh, Gallant's the horse I'm really interested in. He shouldn't have been able to do that second up, uh, first up, first, first yeah. up. That's a really good first up effort on pace in a uh, tough race. So, and the thing that finished all ticks for him, you know. But then, I still, I just get this feeling, Jumpy, that if the right internationals come here, oh, they'll crush it. All these horses are yeah. getting fodder, but oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know until you look at it, but um, anyway, they're all there. And the thing that finished third, Barisha, the um, Spurden horse, he was fifty-one in nineteen on the on the VOP. Uh, in, uh, came back, which had a golden ticket into the Caulfield Cup is on the Mornington Cup. It's uh, got a tender nick, so yeah, it's, it's out. So that's a bit of a shame because I thought he's something that, especially for Alfred, the place part of there, Ponzi yeah. might have been able to run a place with big odds in a Caulfield Cup. Uh, race nine was taken out by, speaking of good three year old spots, he's our Rocky. Uh, top like 245, they did bet 290 or something. I think. Well, he's a four year old, but anyway, four -year -old. he's. Um, He's the best of that group, I think. Um, which is a point Ralphie made on the last show from a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I tried to make a case for Sebring Sun because yep. he's a horse that's got unrealised talent. But um, I mean, we've got one proper race horse here, and the rest a bunch of garbage, and he just destroyed them. So yeah, there's not much to say there other than he's flying, and he'll be very hard to beat in the Tourac or whatever he goes into. So. Uh, and let's just not, let's not even bother with race 10, let's pretend it didn't happen, Joby. It was very odd because I don't know what happened there because it was SP $31, top flight $31, and it was just steady the whole way through Betty. And it's paid 60s across the tape pots. That was bizarre. Like, yeah, as you say, I wish this race had probably been run at Ballarat on Sunday and we could have brushed it. Probably should have brushed it. Anyway, I mean, that horse has improved. Inexplicable. At, at least five lengths. Yeah. And there's no, he's got no platform for it. He's had ten poor runs in a row. He's got a history of doing that. So I don't know. I, I've got no, I've got no explanation for how horses do that. So if someone has, they can, um, they can say it, not me. Uh, just, uh, I think out of that race, spots Foundry and Nevis for the, um, the talkative Robert Hickmont. Um, where are they out? Are they country cup level or? I think Foundry's a better horse. Nevis is a funny one. He's hard to catch. He's a leader, sort of needs everything to go right. Wasn't a good track for him there on Saturday. Yeah. Foundry's re re ready to win the right race, so, you know, we'll also have a look at Foundry whenever he's, he bobs up next in, in the uh, acceptances. It just seemed to me that they're sort of Bendigo or Geelong Cup horses, and yeah. that's probably about their level. So horses to follow, Gallant is definitely one for me, and um, of course oh, the obvious one is Harlow Gold. Wow, she's a wow horse, and um, I think that New Zealand mare in the first race, Shillelagh, it's interesting. Don't forget Albert of Clonmel. Yeah, go and have a look at that replay. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's similar to that thing in Hong Kong. If they can sort their manners out, mm. um, he's going to be a really, really nice horse because, especially on the synthetic pots, horses just like a. I spent, I spent four days last week out of packing them. 
and I got giddy watching him go around there. Mm. But he was clearly the thing that I'd take out of the 35 odd races or whatever it was, more than I watched out there. Now, the thing to understand when you're watching that replay is that the time's pretty fast, yeah. and there's some nice horses in that race, and he's run past them all. So, well, that you're, probably, you're probably going to Hong Kong because he's a price horse. So, well, um, would he go to Hong Kong with manners like that, though? No, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the two that are, I think you can stick with Jamaica. Yep. I think I think, and he's our Rocky. I'm, he, I think he, he's in ride the crest of the wave while he's in good form, and he'll keep going. So definitely. Uh, Is there anything from the provincials? I mean, there's the last couple well, of the, weeks. The provincials have all been a pack. A few weeks ago, we said like it's you know a bit of a barren yeah. space because you know there's been a lot of pretty average racing. But the last two weeks, there's horses to follow everywhere. But um, just off the top of my head, Pay Up Bro is yeah, that was, yeah. absolutely flying. I'm filthy on myself for letting him go on the synthetic last week, but there we go. Um, and uh, there's a lot of talented horses been going around at the provincials that'll come to town and um, make themselves known. It's um, it's a bit tricky, isn't it, Potts? Because we've got um, well, it's 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 a nice day here in Melbourne today, but apparently we've got 10, 20 mils of rain coming tonight. Which will make sale wet. And normally, that's a meet, meeting where sort of the bigger stables target some of their good horses because they can get down there on the big track. So hopefully, we just get a bit of a split with the weather. And there's even a bit more coming towards the weekend. So we just need a break with the weather because um, it'll be a good day on Saturday with the Underwood Stakes, and then we get another real busy Grand Final weekend. Yeah. But um, so real sure busy. I mean, honestly, why do we have why do we have to have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Like, why do we have to do that? What? Does it punish anyone more than me? No, you're like I'm thinking of you. Like you've got to try and set up three betting rings here. Correct. Um, Good luck with that. It makes no sense at all. I can't understand it. They might as well have a dot. But what the only the, and this is something that I'll mention this um, at some other stage. But hopefully the AFL does the right thing at some stage, mm. which will help them, which will move the AFL Grand Final to a five o'clock kickoff. So they can still keep the, the traditional part of the AFL where they can play the first quarter and a bit, maybe in the daylight. Then you can have your half-time entertainment in the darkness, like what happens at the Super Bowl and places like that. And then you play the second half under lights. And that means that you could run Turnbull Stakes Day on the Saturday as a lead-in to the grand final. And Flemington could mark it as come out, watch the opening, the real big, one of the first big meetings of the spring, and then you can hang around and drink our beer and watch the footy at Flemington. And I think you get a reasonable crowd there. And then, who knows, we might be able to have a Sunday meeting at Seymour or something. But if there was no meeting at Caulfield on Saturday, would anyone even notice? Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure why they took it away from Mornington in the first place, Watts. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And especially... I suppose the interstate punters that aren't interested in AFL would, they, they'd probably notice. So. But, but the thing is, the, those interstate punters, when it, it was only a marginal drop-off, mm. like I know it's Epsom Day or whatever it is in Sydney that yeah. day, but um, like, could you imagine if Turnbull Stakes and Epsom Day were on the same day in the lead into the AFL Grand Final? Pots would just about be the biggest wagering day of the year. In uh, I know what you're in, saying. I just think there'd be a lot of different opinions on that, Jumpy. Anyway, whatever. But my part, just so the punters know too. Last year, I made the mistake of trying to cover all the Friday night meetings with a, a watered down full set. I won't be doing that this year. So those that want to get any of my information on the Friday nights, it'll be the text only stuff. So I'll be, that means I'll just be picking out the races. Where I really think there's an edge for us, and um, yeah, and that brings us to another point. Um, I'm sure that, I'm not sure if the special's still going. I assume it is. Jump on, you can grab the package that will take you f from now right through the spring till the end of Sandown. And not only that, um, you do get Potts's plays, and the Potts's plays had a, a, a really solid weekend. We had a good day on Friday and a ripping day on Sunday out there at Packingham. So I think we've had eight winning races in a row, Jappy, which is good. We needed a good run because we yeah. had, like. I don't but, want to go into it too much, but we we had a bad run and there was something that was really worrying me. Yeah. I made one little change and, and it's turned things around. Yeah. And that change had nothing to do with the way I was doing the form. So anyway, um, I'm glad things have turned around and we're we're, we're back in. Uh, and we're coming yeah, into a good time of year yeah. too. And and the thing is, it just means that you can channel more energy into the um, the better meeting spots. So um, there'll be a couple of good races there at Mooney Valley on the Friday night. It's a Absolute dot ball meeting there on the Saturday at um, Caulfield, and then we get into the the good meeting at Flemington. But we've got Underwood Stakes Day this weekend. That'll be a cracking, cracking day. So hopefully we get some some fine weather. So make sure you head to one to follow and 
uh, grab pots and stuff. Um, good luck, punters. We'll see you next week. Sure.